I have the opportunity to introduce to you Jean Taylor. Uh, Jean is in a doctoral program at Kent State Kent. University and has been um, doing some very cutting edge research for her dissertation on constructionism, counseling, narrative, therapy, and integrating um, a process called pictorial analysis. And um, she has served as an adjunct uh, professor um, at uh, John Carroll, at Kent, at um, uh, Neocom, Neomed, or, or Neomed, and um, and uh, has uh, is also a um, marriage and family therapist. Yes. So um, we are very very fortunate to have Jean this evening, and um, I'm going to turn the program over to her. And so please join me in welcoming. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, and I'm honored to be here. Honored to be able to share this intervention with you, and it's wonderful to see former students. Mm -hmm. And because we talked about this in the classes, so this is wonderful. Um, we're going to talk about pictorial narratives. Does everybody have a folder with stuff in it? Okay, if, every, if I have extras here if you need one, and I also have crayons. You can keep everything that you've been given, crayons and all. If you don't want to keep them, you can take them home or give them back, I don't care, okay. Inside your folder, very briefly, um, just so you know, are three pieces of plain paper. You'll need those. And then when we get started with this, I want you to just put your folders away and turn off your thinking caps because this isn't about thinking tonight. It's about experience. It's about experiencing, okay? And that's what constructionist interventions are about. It's the client's experience. It's their subjective experience. Let me just get a feel for where you guys are at in your program. How many of you are doing clinicals in internship or practicum? Excellent. Oh, excellent. So you're almost done. Internship? Wonderful. And where are, are you working with? How many people work with kids? Adolescents? Adults? Good. You can use this intervention with all ages, with any client, really. Um, you can, um, uh, well, we'll get, to, we'll get to some of that stuff in just a few minutes in terms of how to implement it and how to invite clients to participate in it. Um, uh, what I wanted to do was very briefly, in your folder, this is, a, this is an art, it's my first professional scholarly publication. I'm proud to admit this. But this is so relevant for this class. It's integrating pictorial narratives, which is what you're going to learn tonight, with my career story. Did you all do my career story? Good. So you know what we're going to, you'll know what this article is about. This was the work I did when I worked at John Carroll here a few couple years ago. I was in the Career Center, and I worked with the alum, with alumni of John Carroll, and these are two real live case examples that, in, that I uh, used, uh, clients that I used both pictorial narratives and my career story. And what you'll find is that pictorial narratives can be used with just about any counseling approach you take. They can be used with pretty much any theoretical orientation you're drawn to um, and with clients of different cultures, uh, clients with different presenting problems um, and so this, this article is specifically focused on using pictorial narratives in a career counseling context, which is exactly what this class is about. So at your leisure, read this. And the first, the introduction is, is meaty. It's good information. There may be something from the introduction on your exam, I don't know, but it's good stuff, and in, just in the introduction alone. The second on the left side is a more specific handout on constructionism and constructionist career counseling and what that's all about. And whenever we talk about constructionism, our focus is on meaning. We want to focus on meaning. Okay, what's meaningful for the client? What's meaningful for the client is the most important thing. That's how we facilitate change. It's not about what's meaningful for us. It's about what's meaningful for the client. Pictorial narratives is just one tool in your toolbox that you can use to access what clients find meaningful in their lives, okay? And then on the right side is there are specific uh, handouts specifically related to the intervention itself. 
steps, rationale, and hopeful outcomes is a really nice summary. This is the whole intervention broken down into three pages. Gives the steps, the rationale for why you do each step, why you say what you say and how you say it, and the hopeful outcomes. And then this in the back is um, a detailed handout, detailed on how to implement it. So what you don't get in class tonight, you can read this. Hopefully that will shed more light on it for you if you want to try it with the client. I give workshops at my practice. Uh, it's Avenues of Counseling in Bath, Ohio. Um, and I'll be giving one in January or February. So at the end of class, I'll pass out a sheet. If you're interested in attending a, a more in-depth, more nuanced training on how to do pictorial narratives, sign up and I'll make sure you get on the mailing list and you'll be invited to the next training. And they're really reasonable. And for students, it's like practically free, I think, if you're a student. So that's, that's good. So just to wet your whistle before we get started, I just want to remind you, because I think you've already heard some of this stuff, when we talk about constructionism and constructionist counseling practices, um, just, just to remind you, okay? Whereas modern, well, it's postmodern. Are, are you familiar with postmodern counseling practices? Postmodern? Constructionism is postmodern. Narrative is postmodern. Modernistic counseling approaches are pre your pre traditional ones psychoanalytic, cognitive behavioral, rational emotive. Humanism, to some extent, humanism kind of starts crossing over into postmodernism. And for most of the first half of the 20th century, counseling was dominated by these modernistic counseling practices that tend to focus on deficits, clients' deficits. So a symptom is seen as a deficit, something wrong internal to the client, something's wrong. Whereas postmodern constructionist counseling practices focus on strengths. Okay? Symptoms are not viewed as deficits. Symptoms are viewed as valuable information that signal something needs to be changed. But the symptoms signal something isn't working anymore in the client's life. Okay? Modernistic counseling practices focus on scores. Maybe you've read this in some of Dr. Savickas' work. The focus is on scores, such as paper and pencil test results, and scatter plots, and MMPI results, things like that. Narrative and constructionist postmodern approaches focus on stories. And there's research uh, growing rapidly that shows that clients need to tell their stories because it's through our stories that we derive a sense of our identity and who we are. And when we're experiencing problems in our lives, our old stories aren't working anymore and they need to be revised, right? Richard, right? You're nodding your head, you get it, don't you? So as we go through this, I hope some of this will feel intuitively pleasing to you. If it does, that could mean <laughs> that you are a constructionist counselor it could mean that this could be a direction that you might want to pursue in terms of your counseling practice. You're beginning now, it's, it's not realistic for you to say, this is my preferred theoretical orientation, you're learning. But uh, pay attention to what feels intuitively pleasing to you, and if this does, you'll know it. You will know it. Um, we, um, in, in, in narrative and constructionist approaches, the way therapeutic change occurs is we don't try to eliminate the problem. We don't eliminate the problem. We try to change the meaning associated with it. And when we change meanings and we just facilitate a shift, just a little shift in the way clients view themselves and the world around them, their behavior changes. But the problem is, how do we know what, how they view their world? How do we know that? And, and we know, as counselors, that words, language, just asking somebody to talk about, um, well, tell me why you're here. What is your problem? You know, oh, you say you have an anger problem. Well, tell me more about that. We're limited in really understanding their subjective reality when we just focus on the words. 
when we use experiential approaches such as music, dance, movement, drawings, drawings, which is what pictorial narratives uses, we access implicit or below the level of consciousness, of conscious awareness, implicit memories and meanings that ac we access them and bring them up to the conscious level. That's what half of pictorial narratives will help you do through the drawing. I, but I want to emphasize this is not art therapy. I don't even like to consider it a creative intervention. There isn't that much creativity in this. It's about drawing a picture, and that picture of the client's drawing serves as a springboard that launches the counselor and the client in a dialogue, a meaningful dialogue. And constructionist narrative approaches view dialogue as the major vehicle of healing. It's the dialogue. So we want to engage our clients in a meaningful dialogue, a conversation. That's all this is about, is getting involved, getting engaged, both of us, in a conversation where the counselor never assumes that she or he knows more about the client than the client does. I would never, ever say to my client, I know more about you than you, Hannah, right? Um, you're the expert on you. I know a little bit about counseling. Let's work together as a team. Okay, we privilege the client's voice. If you were to look behind a one-way mirror in a counseling session with a counselor and a client doing narrative work, you would not know who was the counselor and who is the client. You wouldn't be able to tell. They're both just talking, equally engaged. And curiosity. If I could give you all a gift tonight, I would give you all a huge dose of curiosity. Be curious. Be genuinely curious, and that's what we're going to practice tonight. And in a way, we're going to practice being curious with each other, okay? And um, so I'm, that's sort of just to, I said, I said all that just to wet your whistle. So put everything away now. But take out the white pieces of paper and keep your crayons out, okay? Take a sip of water here. Any questions so far? All right. So what I'm going to ask you all to do, and I'm going to, we're going to do, try to improvise this a little bit, is ask, it, ask you in a way as if you were a client. And by the way, you could do this in group counseling as well. Anybody, anybody in here work with groups? You can do it in group, OK? Um, you can do it in couples. You can do it in all sorts of counseling modalities. So when you did my career story, how long ago is that, my career story? Four weeks ago. Whether, you, whether it's derived from my career story or not, think about a dilemma you may have, a dilemma. And we could keep it focused on a career dilemma that you may have, a career, you know, something that may actually take you yourselves to counseling. Maybe it's something that's just persisted you just can't get rid of it. It's just followed you your whole life, maybe. Something like, gee, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. That was the story of my life until I was about 50, OK? And um, I took all sorts of inventories and things, but they weren't all that helpful to me because they, they weren't meaningful. So think about a dilemma. And one thing I'm going to ask, and I always ask, I don't ask clients to do this. I invite them. We invite clients to do this activity. And if they don't want to do it, then I bag it. <laughs> OK, we don't have to do it. And I usually preface it by saying, Let's, can we do something different? It involves drawing. And usually what happens is the first thing, you, when as soon as you say drawing, anxiety shoots up, right? <gasps> I can't draw, right? You don't need to know how to draw. It's not art. Stick figures are perfectly OK. And I'm going to ask you, think about your problem as if this was a counseling. Maybe this is a big group counseling session, maybe, even. And draw it. Draw your problem. Stick figures are perfectly acceptable. Use any colors you want. Lines, circles, squares, people, whatever you want to draw. However you want to draw it. Draw your problem. The problem that brought you to counseling or the problem that you're struggling with in the here and, and now in the moment. Okay. 
And generally, people will agree to do it. Most of the time, people agree to do it. And then what I say is, while you're doing that, I'm just going to catch up on a little reading. So I always have a little article or something by my side. And I fake like I'm reading. OK, I'm not really reading. What I'm really doing is inconspicuously monitoring them to see if they're engaged. And how do you know if your client is engaged in the process? Because they're doing it. They're, they're choosing their colors carefully. They're thinking. They're reflecting. They're thinking about what they want to draw. Sometimes they're sitting there and they're struggling, struggling. They don't do anything. They're obviously struggling. And when that happens, I, I ask, if this, are you not comfortable doing this? And if they say, no, I'm not comfortable, I say, then we don't have to do it. Same goes for everybody in here. If you don't even want to do this, you don't have to draw. You don't have to participate in the drawing at all. You can just sit back and observe. And that would be valuable, too, to hear what your observations are about this whole process. It's up to you. You are the experts. You are the clients. You are the privileged voice in this room. OK? And uh, uh, let's, we have to cut it short. We can, normally, I give the client pretty much as much time as they need, you know? But um, let's maybe five minutes. Five minutes, so we have plenty of time to process it and talk about it. Oh, I forgot a very important detail. When you're done with your picture, I want you to give it a catchy title. Give it a catchy title, like it's going to be a blockbuster movie or a best-selling novel, a catchy title. That's an important piece. And you don't have to memorize any of this. It's all in your folder. All of these instructions, these important things to include, are all in the, in the handouts. So what I'd like you, okay, what I'd like you to do now, this is where we're going to practice. You're going to now, you're going to practice being curious. So at your table, most of you are people, you're with people. You know, maybe you two, since you're alone, maybe you two could pair up if that's OK. That way, everybody's got somebody to talk with. What I want you to do now is you're the, you take turns. You, you just talk to each other. And I want you to be curious and ask the person who did the drawing, tell me about your picture. This is their story. This is a story. This is their problem story. This is what brought you guys into counseling. OK? And I want to know what your subjective reality is about this problem. I'm not going to assume that I know more about it than you do. I'm not going to assume that I'm an expert on your problem. I want to know what it feels like to be you inside your body. So I want you to talk to them and say, so and your name again Emily. is Emily. <laughs> Emily, tell me about your picture. And Emily's going to tell me. And I want you to ask questions. Well, what does this mean? And ooh, what does this black thing mean? And what does this mean? And be curious. And as you're asking them, there's important questions to ask right here on the board. When, when you look at this picture, what is the predominant? But do this after they talk about it. What is the predominant emotion you feel when you look at your problem picture? What is the first thought that comes into your head when you look in the pro at, the, at your picture? Where in your body does the problem live? And when you look at your picture, how old do you feel in this picture? How old do you feel? Those are the four questions. OK? But ask those after you get, you get to hear a little bit about what the pictures are about. So go ahead. Go ahead and just do that. Just to save time, I went, did you hear how the room just came alive? Everybody just start talking, and that's exactly what happens in the counseling room. And as people doing internships, do you ever come across a client? And you go, God, I don't know what to say to this client. I don't know what to ask. 
I don't know what to do for this client. I have all this pressure. Do you ever feel that way? This relieves you of all that pressure because what you're, it's not our job to figure it out. It's the clients. They know the answers. And this helps them to get in touch with the answers. It takes all the pressure off of the counselor. Not that it's making your job any easier, but it, again, it honors the client. It honors their reality and their voice. So would anybody like to share theirs with the class and for the camera as well? You would? Good. What's your name? Zach. Zach. Okay. So what we're going to do is, um, can you zoom in up here? Okay. So Zach, how about we come up here? So in, in again, this if Zach was my client, and is this a career issue, Zach? Uh, life. Life. And I'm one of those people, I don't separate clinical counseling and career. I don't separate them at all. You can't. I don't think you can. I just don't. They, are, they just are enmeshed. You can't separate them. So this is a, your problem. Yeah. And what's the title of it? Uh, the Stressors of Zip. The Stressors of Zip. Wow. Tell us about this story, Zach. Um, so it's kind of a cluster of different things going on in my life. Uh -huh. um, so the main one that sticks out is money. Um, money? I, Constantly, I'm worried about money, like having enough for the future, having enough for the present, which leads to currently I work three jobs. Um, three so jobs. that's the I valet, which is the car, um, the desk. I'm a teacher at Monarch High School, and I'm also a counselor at Benedictine High School. Um, so then that takes a lot of time, which leads to I'm not sleeping. Um, I ah. get around three and a half, four hours of sleep a night. Um, what is this? That's me not sleeping. Oh, it's you in a bed. Okay, it's him in a bed. Okay. Z's. I thought it was some kind of a saw, but okay. Yeah. Oh, can you see here? Let's make sure that these folks can see. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, um, I put my girlfriend into my parents because I had to visit my parents. I mean, I went to Thanksgiving. But girlfriend up here? Yeah. Parents? So, like, balancing those out. And then uh, I put a scale because ever since college, weight's been a problem. So trying to find time to do that and then a textbook because I'm working on both master, both uh, counselor masters here, so. Okay. Yeah. It's a lot. So, curious. Anybody curious about anything? What do you notice? What do you want to ask about? Why is the, the dollar sign is green? It really pops out. Everything else is blue. Does that mean anything to you? Yeah, it's, that's uh, the main stressor is I think that leads to, it's like the root of all evil. This is really yeah. center. And look, it's even high up here and everything. And where are you in this picture? Oh, not sleeping. He's up there not sleeping, right up there with that money stress, too. Um, I, just little things. Nobody has facial expressions except you, a little teeny bit. Does that mean anything? No, I just I get a John face. Okay. Uh, when you look at this picture, what's a fruit, what is the feeling that you feel? What emotion do you feel? Uh, stress. 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 It's stressful. Is there another feeling? And at this point, a lot of times I'll give them a feelings word list because it's hard to come up with feelings words. Stress is good. Is there anger? Are you sad? Are you disappointed? Are you happy? You know. I mean, I'm definitely not happy. You're not happy. See, and clients have a hard time, don't they, coming up with how they, describing how they feel. That's okay. We help, this helps get them get in touch with that. You're not happy. You're stressed. Okay. Anything else? Not really. Okay. How about your body? Where in your body does this problem live? Where do you feel it in your body? Um, my neck. His neck, your neck. Do you have symptoms? What? Um, uh, chronic neck pain. I have to go to a chiropractor. Uh huh. And we hold. And this. And this is sort of captures this holistic kind of. We hold our our problems and our stress in our bodies, and our bodies know it. And it's important to get in touch with that as well. When you look at, is this something you've experienced before? This um, reality of yours, this problem. Just really in the last. Uh, 
year. So how old do you feel when you look at this here? Um, well, I was telling Richard, I kind of feel like a junior in college. How old is that? Um, 20. And how old are you? 24. Tell us more about feeling like a junior in college. Um, and so I don't feel like I feel the responsibilities of being an adult. So that was what put me in the college uh, mindset. But then like freshmen kind of come in and they're all, you know, let's get drunk. Let's go party. Um, sophomores kind of focus, try to get their like grades where they want to get, start focusing on, on their major and all that stuff. Yes. Seniors, they're just done with everything. So juniors kind of at that point where they're focusing on <laughs> academics, social life, trying to find a job, trying to maintain everything. Interesting. Yeah. So you're, you feel younger than you are. Yeah. And I hate to ask it like this, but how do you feel about feeling younger than you are? I mean, maturity-wise, I am younger than I uh, am, and anyone can tell you that. But I mean... Are you mean you're saying that you're emotionally emotionally and maturity wise immature you feel yeah. like you're emotionally immature uh regarding some aspects yeah sure and um and you mentioned like drinking and partying is that part of that any of that part of that in here um a lot less a lot less um, yeah yeah okay maybe that's part of growing up a little bit but you feel like you're still sort of back like younger than you are. It's very common when you ask the age question. Many people say they either feel, most people say they feel younger than they are, sometimes very young, like age 12, age 10, age 8. Suggesting it's just a suggestion that maybe that's where they've been stuck and they've been, their, their stuckness occurred maybe around that age. Other people, uh, uh, somebody in here I talk to feels older. Sometimes people say, oh, I feel like I'm 100. Well, what does that mean? Often it means they're exhausted. I'm exhausted. I can't go on anymore. You know, rarely in the problem picture do people feel the same age. It's fascinating. It's just fascinating. So, Zach, do we have, how many of you can relate to Zach? <laughs> no kidding. You're a graduate student, right? And I looked at your pictures, and every time I do this, I see pictures that look like, you know, this disjointed. I see clocks. I see dollar signs. I see cars. Time management is big books. Graduate, all these stressors weighing heavy on, you know what I mean? It's really coming. Do you all feel like you know him a little bit better? Can you, do you feel, like, compassionate towards him? Yeah. We, we, there's like a, I feel close to you, I just met you, <laughs> you know? Thank you so much for sharing, we're not done yet. We're not done yet, okay, we're not done. But can you share for the second part of this? Sure. Good, because we're gonna pick up on this. Okay, um, so now what we're gonna do is regroup now and I'm gonna ask you to do a second picture. This is important, okay? You go sit down, oh. thanks. Take and this has to be on a separate piece of paper. Must be on a separate piece of paper. That's why I gave you three sheets. Tonight we're only going to have time to do two pictures, which is fine. So, how many of you have heard the miracle question? Miracle question. It's your bread and butter. You're the expert. Okay, so how, okay, here I'm going to use the miracle question. You can tweak it however you want. Suppose tonight, when you go to bed, a miracle will occur in your sleep. A miracle. It's a miracle. Sometimes with kids, I'll embellish it. A little fairy's going to come in and sprinkle fairy dust over you. It's a miracle. You wake up in the morning. You don't even know a miracle occurred, but something is different. Oh, it's different. It's different. You feel different. You look different. You're behaving differently. Your emotions are different. It's a miracle. It's a miraculous change. Your problem that you your problem has suddenly and miraculously disappeared. So I'd like you to draw your miracle. However, it's so important to include the caveats. A couple of caveats that don't count as miracles. Winning the lottery does not count. Getting a brand new car suddenly and miraculously in your driveway will not count. You're not allowed to stop the clock. You can't stop time. 
If part of your picture is of somebody in your family or some outside entity, uh, maybe a, a father who you've never been able to get approval from, something like that, you can't change dad. The only change that occurs in your miracle picture is you. Everything else stays the same. So the clock is still there. The money's still, the lack of money is still there. Do you know what I'm saying? The insurance company, somebody drew the insurance company, that's still bugging you. You can't change the insurance company, right? And this is, this is about the general principle. The only people in life that we can change are ourselves. So how do you look differently and feel and behave differently if, how would you, how would that look if a miracle occurred? And when you're done with that, give it a catchy title. Okay, let's get Zach up here again. Let's get Zach up here and then bring both pictures, Zach, okay, if you don't mind. And we'll remind you guys, remind the class of what his problem looked like and his chaos and all of this disjointedness, non-connectedness here. Zach's problem. This, oh, by the way, what does Zips mean? Uh, it's my nickname. My last name is Zipper, so everyone calls Okay, me. Zips. Zip? Zip. Zip. Okay. Here's his, his problem. And now, your miracle is called the health or health and wellness of Zip. And tell us about your miracle. Um, so the first thing is I drew a scale with my uh, target weight. Okay. And then the second one, I had me sleeping by 11 o'clock. Uh, ah. And I drew a bottle of melatonin. Apparently that's supposed to help you It sleep. does. I hear that helps. Yeah. It, so. it helps. So how have you changed in this? Uh, I've lost weight and I'm getting sleep. He's lost weight and he's getting sleep. Now, from a counseling perspective, you're the counselor. What are some of your first goals going to be? What are you going to help him work on? His goals. His goals. Planning out the day, getting sleep, making sure you, how are you going to get to bed by 11 o'clock? How are you going to get down to this weight that you want to be? It's perfect. You know, you've got some goals. You didn't have to think of those. You didn't have to go to the treatment planners and look them up, did you? You got them right from the source. This is exactly what he's telling you, what he wants to do in counseling. He just told you. And the, this is where the change, theoretically, the change occurs and constructs constructivist, constructionist, postmodern approaches focus on the contrast between two competing realities. Here we have his two, all of you just drew two competing realities. You have your problem, that's your reality right now, right? That's your problem. And you have your miracle, okay? Problem, two competing realities. Does this feel real to you, Zach? Yeah. Feel he's living it right now. You better believe it feels real. Have you ever had this? Have you ever experienced this before? Yeah. Yes. It's po is this possible? Yeah. Yes, it's possible. Reality, reality, competing can't be true simultaneously. Now, what we're not going to try to do is eliminate this. This, if you try, if you tell your clients, okay, we're going to get rid of this problem. I have seen it, and before my eyes, sometimes they get very anxious. <gasps> don't take away my problem. You can't. We can't. We don't want to take their problem away because they're not here yet. And without, this is all they know right now, and they're going to be in limbo if we take it away from them anyway. Who are we to take it away from them, right? What we want to do is... This is the current problem story. This is the miracle story. We want to integrate these two so that the problem story becomes less dominant and this one becomes more dominant. And a really cool thing you can do is like hold it up to the light. So in the, in the miracle story, you can see shadows of the problem story, but it's not dominant anymore, is it? It's still part of your experience. It's part of your life. But this is no longer your dominant story, Zach. This will be. This will be. And that's what we're going to work towards in counseling. We've got a couple of really great goals here, don't we? And a third picture, which we won't do tonight, is in the middle. 
a baby step picture. Have them draw a baby step, a very, very small step the client could be, is, would be willing to take to help create movement to get from here to here. So envision, so maybe what might that baby step be, Zach? If you were to draw a baby step picture, what might one small thing, very small baby steps? A working out is, could be a little big. Okay, we're going to have to break that down. When are you going to work out? How are you going to work out? Where are you going to work out? Can you afford to work out? That might be even too big. How about a calendar, a planner or something? Would that help? I mean, I have one. Are you using it? Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll tweak it. Whatever. You have to come up with a baby step, okay? He's got a baby step. Now then, imagine you have a third picture in the middle. You guys, here's your treatment plan. Here's the problem. Here's the goal. And the middle picture is how you're going to get there. So if anything, in its most simplest form, pictorial narratives provide you with a client-driven treatment plan. You didn't do it. The client did it. You didn't have to go, like I said, when I was in your place, I fantasized for this huge book that had like 50 million pages in it. And every single one of my clients were in that book. So I'd look up John and Mary Jones. And I wanted to look in this book to find out exactly what I should do for my John and Mary Jones. It doesn't exist. I don't know what to do for them. They know what they need to do. And it's up to us to access that information from them. And we help them. And so all sorts of things. So the, the change is the juxtaposition of these two contrasting stories. This is what the brain needs to facilitate a shift in perspective. You, you make these vividly real. You feel this. You know this is possible. You work towards this, right? Let me just show you a couple things. Thank you very much. Can I, I want you to see this juxtaposition. Look at this, you guys. What's your name? Sydney. Sydney, look at Sydney's. We're not, we don't even know the details, but look at Sydney's problem picture. Bubble girl interrupted. Man, something's going on in Sydney's life with this big red thing blocking her from something. She's here in this bubble all alone, right? And these, all these people are out here with balloons and stuff. Here's her miracle. Look at the juxtaposition. Look how qualitatively different they are. In her miracle, she is. Oh, there's a sunshine. You see sunshines in miracle pictures all the time. There's a sun. And look, she's connected with somebody. There's, there's so much less chaos in this than there is in this. Does this feel real to you? Have you ever been here before? Long time. You think this is possible? Mm -hmm. Right. And I would, I would devote time in my session to helping explore this story. We break this story open. We talk about it. We really talk about this. Juxtaposition is the key change agent in this intervention. You got to put them side by side and have the client talk to you about how they're different. She's stuck. She can't move in here. She's got that blue bubble around her. Here she's out of it. She moved, you know? Let's see, anybody else's? Look at this one. Well, this one is fascinating. I'll show you this, but may I? If that's okay, is that okay? Look at this, it blows me away, because look, now I don't think they were copying. <laughs> this red line is some kind of a barrier. What's your name? Who, who drew this? What's your name? Raven. Is this a barrier? Yeah. Yeah, block. Look at this miracle. Problem, miracle. A sun. <laughs> Doesn't it just feel better looking at this miracle? She's in such a better place. Have you ever been here before? Yes. Yep. It's possible, isn't it? <coughs> Baby step. How are you going to get from here to here? Just juxtaposing these blows me away. And I do want to show a couple of the men's over here. Thank you if I may, the mountain guy. In your article that I gave, in your folder, are case examples of two men. One was about 60 and the other was 35 or so. For some reason in career counseling, men, I don't know why, 
like to draw things that resemble mountains. And in both of those pictures in the article, you'll see their problem pictures are they're trying to get over a mountain. It's some man thing. <laughs> What's your first name again? Jason. 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 Here's his miracle. Look at this. It's just sort of reminded me of a mountain because up here is some prize. And here he is trying to get up this, to reach something high up this prize. And here's his miracle. Something has shifted. Is this possible? Oh, yeah. Let's make it possible. Let's make it, right? We're going to help you make it possible. Okay? Anybody else you want to share the juxtaposition? To see the contrast. Fascinating is the contrast. Yes. Let's see. Oh, okay. Richard, right? Problem. Return to fitness. Is this a, a casualty of graduate school? Yeah, look at him. <laughs> He's, you got some skills. But well, what does this mean? What does this mean? So, like, I'm looking in the mirror. Yeah. And, like, I can see, like, you know, I'm looking a little chubby on the face. He's not liking you know? it. Yeah, like I, like, I know I can do better. Like, I'm okay. I'm getting my exercise in, but I'm not working out as intensely as I used to. And that's your problem. Yeah. Have you ever been this way before? Mm -hmm. So Something that kind of follows you in life? Yeah. Kind of? The bug is bugging. It's manifesting again. Yeah. Yeah. Miracle. Return to, or Mr. Lean. <laughs> what does this mean? What are you all laughing at? I don't get it. What is this? It's just Richard. Mr. Lee. I like it. What is this? That's a duffel bag. Oh, okay. So we're going to find, help you do this. You want, this is what you need, right? And you're not feeling good about where you're at right now, right? Beautiful. Anybody else? Take a look. May I? Sure. Just looking. Where's oh, the other one. I don't have a catchy title on this one. But. Again, what you'll see is in the problem, chaos and disjointedness. And usually as there's cohesion in the miracle, some sense of cohesion. It's fascinating. And, when, and again, remember, these pictures are much more than, oh, there's a saying, a picture says a thousand words. The pictures are only a springboard. It will, they will launch you into a dialogue that will be meaningful to you. You'll understand your client better. Most important, your client will feel heard, validated, and that what they have to say is important because you're going to show them how curious you are. And your responses are going to be, tell me more. I want to hear more. I want to hear more. And they'll tell you. And I guarantee you they'll come back. They'll come back. Um, but again, um, more, there's a lot more nuanced issues when doing these, but I, the thing is I want to emphasize, you can't mess up doing this. You can't go wrong. No matter what, you can't go wrong. You can ask a client to do it, and a, all right, I'll tell you a story. This is a story. May I? The worst group of people to ever do this with are doctoral students, because I had a doc student, a class of doc students. I swear, this guy was a smart aleck. Draw your problem picture. <laughs> Guarantee, I swear, that's what he drew. It's shallow. What do you do with this picture? It's shallow. Draw, I'm going to use a couple pieces. <laughs> what do you think he drew for his miracle picture? Smiley face. Miracle. How silly can you get? His baby step picture. Neutral face. Okay. And so sometimes you're going to get pictures from clients that it's like, what do I do with this? And maybe you can't do much with it. It doesn't happen very often. But when it does, so what? Move on to something else. If you don't get a lot out of it, if you don't get into a big conversation about it, move on to something else. I also had a client that did this right here at John Carroll. His, a true story. He struggled. He struggled. He may have been on the spectrum, this kid. May have been on the spectrum. He drew in red. Well, it was in ink, and up here was this squiggly thing, and these, 
it was just up in the upper corner of the paper. And I said, are you having a hard time with this? And he goes, yeah, I really don't want to do this activity. I said, okay, we don't have to do it. And I took the clipboard back. And I looked at it and I said, well, what is this anyway, just out of curiosity? And he said, this is a jar with my head in it and the stuff spewing out is my rage. That's what he said. A little teeny picture like that. It's not the picture, it's the dialogue. It's the dialogue that emerges as you two talk about what the picture means. Okay? You can't mess it up. Yeah. Thank you. Dialogue. For sure. So like Richard's was very easy to see and it's like kind of like, oh, what is this? It's like, I want to go to the gym again. Exactly. And lose weight to where like, exactly. you know, my partners, I, they use stick figures and they use right. different symbols where I'm like, may oh. I? Yeah, go ahead. Just <laughs> the juxtaposition. You're, this is yours, right? Yeah. Whoa. Problem miracle. This is a, this is a complex story is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, there's a lot to talk about here. You're right, Rich is pretty clear cut. Even Zach's is kind of clear cut. You know, your client's pictures aren't going to be clear cut. You're, back in the corner, you did that one with your client, your child client. You're going to have him do a miracle picture, aren't you? Yes. Please do. He had, how old was your client? He's 15. You want to share? Just Are you allowed? Uh, yeah, I can share it all. We don't know who he is. We don't know who the client is, do we? Um, I had him um, draw a picture of Thank you. Good point. And he just pretty much wrote, I did this because I feel empty inside, and black is one of my favorite colors. And he drew a blackness. He just drew blackness. Like in the corner, there's black here. Also yeah. The other side of it. Yeah. Like there's black here with his name. And his name. So tomorrow you're going to ask him to do a miracle. Yeah. Now you have a contrast. Now you have something to work with, right? Right, you need to have both of them. Any other questions? Try it, that's what I'm trying to encourage you to do. Just try it. If you want, you can call me on the phone. I'll give you a, a quick, I'll give you a quick uh, rundown review crash course before you do it. I'll be happy to do that. If you wanna to come to a longer training session, like a three hour one, that will be coming up in January. Sign the sheet, I'll make sure it's going around. Any other? I'm sure there's millions of things I forgot. <coughs> Here's the sheet that's going around. If you want to just put your name and email, I'll make sure you're invited. Okay? 820. I'm done. Thank you very much, you guys. Thank you. Good. Thank you.